I came downstairs to uh, get some groceries, but it's raining, so I might have to wait a little bit and walk around the complex. I was um, trying to talk about history, and I hated history growing up. It was so asinine, it was so boring. And the reason for that is it's never taught in context. And in fact, a lot of people have an interest in making sure that you don't understand history. The first reason is because a lot of the victors in today's economy got there through violent means, primarily by having a strong military. It's not just the British Empire, um, it's, it's just almost everyone. You can think about the United States, you know, trying to invade and occupy to this day, Iraq. And Iraq, if you understand history, was, is, a, is essentially a made up country that, that was created out of a map post one of the world wars. And as you can see, the map makers made a mistake. And to this day, we're all paying for the history makers mistakes. So the first reason that we don't understand history is because the victors don't have an interest in teaching it to us. Why? Because oftentimes history reveals atrocities. It reveals tragedies that people would rather not, that governments, and not just governments, but just anyone involved in the current power structure would rather not reveal. The most obvious example would be Vietnam. Uh, if you're in the in the U.S., we, we've all seen the picture of you know the little girl running away from napalm, and I think that might have been the picture or one of them that convinced Martin Luther King to have a speech that was anti against the Vietnam Vietnamese War, uh, called Beyond Vietnam. Now, interesting. You know, he actually was shot and killed the, on the same day a year after making that speech, on the exact one year anniversary of making that speech beyond Vietnam. So that's the first reason. The second reason I suspect is because it's just too complex. If you wanted to study just the history of Singapore, the Singaporean history is a short history. It, it had independence in the 1960s. But if you want to really understand what happened here, essentially the British were driven out of Malaysia. They wanted Malaysia and Singapore. Malaysia and Singapore wanted to be one country, were in fact one country, there was no Singapore. And it wasn't until a Indonesian uh, leader attacked the British in Malaysia that the British decided that maybe they didn't want to hold on to Malaysia after all. Maybe they were just okay with having a port in Singapore. Because of course, at this point, the British Navy, the economy and the trade was really focused on the Navy and still to this day is focused on delivering items by ship. You would think it would be by, by plane, but it's still by ship, something like 80 to 90% um, of worldwide trade with number one being oil and I believe number two being coffee. And if we have a hard time understanding history in Singapore, which is only about 60 or 70 years old, you can only imagine what it's like to try to understand European history. And a lot of people would say, well, you know, why bother? You know, we have so many different things going on today. Why bother trying to learn so much about history when we're never gonna understand all of it because of number one, the information isn't there because of what we just talked about. We're only going to have a limited portfolio of information. And even if you have that portfolio, chances are you're not gonna be able to understand everything because you're not gonna have access to a lot of the information that's necessary to come to a, an objective conclusion. Fine. The third reason um, might be why, in terms of why we don't study or learn history properly, is because in order to learn it properly, you would have to travel all over the world. You would have to go all over the world and you would have to, you know, figure, make connections between what, connections between what you see all over the world. And you can't just do it by going to a resort. You can't do it the easy way. You would have to walk, take public transportation, uh, and just notice things all around you. And until recently, traveling around the world was only something that rich people could do. And most rich people, well, you know, they have families, they uh, are not necessarily interested in, in, a, in a sort of an educational you know, endeavor at the age of 40, or 30, or even 50. 
um, most people based on the economic system work at their, in their homeland all their lives and then only travel when they're retired after the age of 65. And if you're 65, I can tell you that you're, prob you're probably not gonna be able to walk you know, seven miles, eight miles a day in order to truly understand the country that you're visiting. And you're probably not gonna be in a position where you're gonna be, try all the different street food. You're more likely gonna be in a position where you only manage to go on a, on a tour with a tour guide and get a superficial understanding of what really is going on. Because that tour guide probably does not have an interest in teaching you history either. And it's not as if that tour guide has received an excellent education in his home country or her, her home country about the history. So, the relevant history. So, how do we learn history? If even in a country like Singapore, which is transparent, most people don't know that it's independent because an Indonesian general attacked Malaysia. Most people here are not taught that. So how would you manage to understand history in, a, in say, Europe or you know, even longer in a place like the United States? So one of the ways, like I said, is travel and just trying to pay attention to what you see. Now, most people can't do that. So that's one of the reasons why we don't have a good understanding of history. So you would think that teachers um, in the West, you know, they get three months off every year. You would think the ones who are already tenured would be able to travel and gain this information, but it's actually, for whatever reason, it's not happening. Because like I said, a lot of people have families, a lot of people prefer to stay close to home. Another reason people are not taught history properly is because there's a tension between having more diverse societies and figuring out how the power structure in those diverse societies came to be. So if you look at the United States, the African-American population uh, is almost, according to Federal Reserve surveys and data, um, has almost zero net worth as a group. You know, you can at that point realize that that's probably, a, that should not be the case because slavery uh, due to the co cotton industries, tobacco and sugar in the Western hemisphere was something that was very lucrative. And for the people that were working in the mines or getting, in terms of gold and silver, or picking the cotton or getting the tobacco, those people should be in a better situation than they are now. So you can see that there's a tension just on that one issue. There's also, say, take Germany. Right now, the most conservative place in Germany uh, is the Saxony area. Well, it turns out that the you know, new Holy Roman Empire, after it collapsed elsewhere, uh, was actually repositioned itself in the Saxony area in Germany, which is now the most you know, sort of anti-immigrant voting area, despite Dresden. Um, I mean, I'm talking about the whole region, not just individual cities. It's now the most intolerant area in all of Germany, which is a pretty tolerant place. So you can take that information and manipulate it and create tensions within the country by putting people, pitting people against each other. And that's actually what's happened in Leipzig uh, in the East German side, where you have a, the younger generation that's flat out opposed to a lot of the older workers uh, who, who have in fact voted for uh, the far right parties within that region. And the reason they've done that is, is we don't know, uh, but you know, you don't, you never know why somebody votes a certain way, but you can see that the potential for domestic dissolution and conflict goes up. The more you try to understand the sources of different conflicts and how we got to be in a particular place. So those are just two countries, uh, Indonesia, if you want to study Indonesian history, that one, not in, in addition to the complexity, you've got a place that's been colonized by the Portuguese, the Dutch, uh, I think the British at some point set up shop, and you have so many different islands. Uh, you have the potential for domestic issues due to the transition between Sukarno uh, and Suharto. And you have somebody, you know, essentially that was uh, moving in Indonesia closer to China, that was Sukarno, very much a nationalistic leader who was who again um, attacked 
was actually responsible for Singapore's independence, um, who was then replaced as part of a deal with Suharto, who was much more uh, pro-West. And in fact, that's one of the reasons that led to the Asian financial crisis in the 1990s, was a lot of these Asian countries uh, borrowed a lot of money for development, and Indonesia led the way uh, in terms of development. Suharto was convinced that by borrowing from the IMF and other places that he would position Indonesia to be a leader in Southeast Asia and the model to follow. And of course, that hasn't worked out, at least not today. So you can go back and study all these things. And so at some point you look at all these things and you ask yourself, why bother? What's the point? And the point, I think it has to be said that number one, the quality, the quality of discussion today is inferior to the quality of discussion in the 1950s and the 1960s. And part of that, part of the conflict in the 50s and 60s was in fact because people were beginning to understand history. Uh, the Suez Canal, of course, was returned to the Egyptians um, as part of an anti-colonial uh, movement led by Nasser, but it was also because people within the UK realized they could not afford to maintain this colonial structure. It's expensive to have a colonial, colonial structure. It's not cheap. And occupation is never cheap. So um, that model has shifted. It's become a little bit more cheap. It's become cheaper to have colony colonization light, which is simply rather than take over the country and you know sort of administer it on behalf of a faraway country, you don't take over the country. You simply establish a military base um, and then uh, try to manipulate information that gets your preferred leaders elected within a democracy. And then from that point, use that vantage point, that advantageous position to sign trade deals whereby that country, which is not occupied, ends up owing a, another country money uh, for trade deals in a currency that is not its own. And typically, if you're making a trade deal with the United States or Japan or Switzerland or the Europeans, that currency will be stronger than the, than the domestic currency, which puts you at the whim, at the whims of a foreign government. So that's what I, what I call you know, having a colony and having it both ways, you know, without having the occupation costs, but with the power to manipulate the economy as well as the information within that country. So that is something that a lot of people don't necessarily understand. They did understand that in the 1950s. Um, and, and part of the reason that you can sort of, you want to understand history is just so you have a better idea of what happens all around you. I'm wearing something now that is, I believe it's not cotton, it's made of calico. Well, calico uh, became a substitute for cotton because of different tariffs. Um, industries, domestic, domestic lobbies were protecting their cotton industries. Going back to slavery, this is why one of the reasons that before technology became so ubiquitous, this is one of the reasons why, um, you know, you, you had uh, a lot of lobbyists um, at, who were, or a lot of, you know, interests, business interests who were uh, pro-slavery because of, of the idea of having cheap or free labor. So the calico industry came up um, simply as a way to bypass tariffs on cotton, um, import tariffs on cotton. And so if you were able to make something that was calico, um, you were in a position where you could compete with the domestic cotton industries in other countries uh, without having to be subjected to a tariff, an onerous tariff. And to this day, you know, you can see how the world trade structure is set up to be gamed by different countries using not just tariffs, but currencies um, and the floating or the flexibility of, flexibility of those currencies. And you can understand nationalism in that way also, because if you're an intelligent, if you are an intelligent leader, you don't want your country to be subject to the whims of a foreign power, even if it's a distant foreign power. And if you do not have control over your own currency, because a lot of your economy is based on exports, the idea of nationalism, the idea of having secure domestic supply chains begins to, to be much more appealing to you. And that's a problem because the growth in the economy 
over, since 1945 has been in part based on this alliance um, that was that's been underpinned by military cooperation and NATO, which then gave rise to this idea of economic cooperation on the basis of secure trade using, in most cases, a foreign navy or the protection of a foreign navy. So when you put all these things together, a lot of the world makes more sense. You can actually get a better sense of what's happening all around you that would, in a way that would not be possible without understanding history. And in fact, everything around you begins to have, I guess, more flavor. You know, all of it, all of it begins to become attached to a higher or a greater meaning. So right now, it's, uh, it's not even six o'clock and it's pouring rain out here in Southeast Asia. You can understand why Vietnam was such a difficult uh, battle for anyone. And I'm sure if I go to Afghanistan, there will be some new data. I have not been there. There will be some new data that I'll understand that when I look out, I'll be able to connect with what I'm seeing in front of me with not only the difficulties, but the triumphs of the past. Because it is a triumph to be able to look at this development and understand that it didn't necessarily have to be. It very well could have been that Singapore, which supported the Vietnam War, uh, again, Singapore was under British occupation, um, decided to go the route of capitalism, uh, also engaged in anti-communist activities, um, and, you know, that's part of the reason why you have a lot of Western, well, one of the reasons why they speak English, for example, as the official language. So everything takes on a, a, an additional layer. And one of the problems with people today in the modern century is they're not multidimensional. They're a single layer. They're just one layer. There's nothing there. And it's, it's almost, it, it's, it's depressing to see because in an era where we should be, we are the most prosperous. Uh, most people do not have to be concerned um, in, about things like hunger, um, and in, you know that's that's in, in certain countries, obviously, uh, not all countries. But even in these countries that have achieved peace and prosperity, the people within those countries have become hollow because of an, a lack of understanding about history. And the and it doesn't have to be that way. It's not a success to create a scenario where. You have all the benefits of an economy that is successful, but none of the intellectual rewards. And that's partly because you want to be in a position where you can create things that make you want to be part of another country. That's been the reason that English has been able to become the, uh, the language in so many different countries, even though the British Empire uh, will never rise again. Uh, the Brit British, you know, Britain is a tiny, tiny country. Um, and the reason it was able to expand it, its influence so much, despite having a history of a number of atrocities, is because of its creativity. It had something more to offer than just, you know, bananas and fruits and cheese and, and whatever it is that people trade these days. So there's something within human nature that demands creativity, and if we're not in a position to be able to, to imbibe it, were in danger in developed countries of having to deal with more complex structures in the sense that a lot of the creativity that we see today probably comes from an immigrant and that's not sustainable. You could argue that you can argue that's not sustainable, but you can also argue that there's always a tension and there has always been a tension between people in power and people who are not in power. And we just had, we talked about an example of that uh, within the African Americans net worth as a group within the United States. We have a situation where, you know, there's a quote that one side of the face cannot smile if the other side is being pinched. But it used to be in almost every piece of literature that, that I read growing up, this idea that if your neighbor was not well off or was suffering, that at some point that contagion would reach your house. And it didn't matter if your neighbor was you know, 20 feet away from you 
or 2,000 feet or 20,000 feet. And being in Singapore now, uh, during this time of um, coronavirus, uh, where you do have a, essentially a lockdown on immigration uh, worldwide, you can see that the literature has been warning us about all these issues for a long time, but people haven't been paying attention. My greatest concern now is that if we are going to create a society of hollow men and women who are well-fed regardless, that there's no point to any of this. There's no point in even going to school, that there's no point in learning anything except math and science, because that would be the way to go if you're not in a position where you can justifiably or honorably walk into a classroom and, and be, be taught by somebody who has more information than you do, and, and furthermore, uh, is in a position to put that information in context. If we're not going to try to achieve that, then there's no point. We might as well just all study math and science, uh, something objective, something purely objective. And then at that point, let us let all these other issues um, simply fall by the wayside. Um, and you know things like there's no point in discussing anything really that is um, a thing, you know that is that is a source of conflict if we can't put it into context. And that's the direction we're heading in today. And if it continues, we I don't know what's what's going to happen uh, in the future. I can only tell you that uh, the status quo is not sustainable. And so the question is how we're going to change it. That's something that I think about a lot. And I think what bothers me is that most people, to the extent that they do think about it, are not able to form cohesive arguments, uh, in part because they lack a contextual understanding of history. And we have to change that to make things better. And if we don't change that, we're running up against so many different factors. One of them is simply the idea that by moving into a video, uh, television, online video structure, that we're going to lose a lot of the complexity that comes with reading language. And that's the direction we're heading in right now. If we're going to lose that complexity within language, we're going to be in a position where we have to get all these issues right. Because if we don't, the best case scenario is a world of hollow men and hollow women.